Hi, uh, welcome to our fourth vlog. Um, this time we're going to be discussing the models of memory and the biological approach. Uh, I'm going to start off with the biological approach. Um, first thing that I want to point out is students often confuse the difference between a hormone and a neurotransmitter. And it's important to know that hormones are produced by endocrine glands and they travel around the bloodstream. Neurotransmitters, on the other hand, are released at synapses and are, well, obviously active in the brain. So our examples of a hormone are things like testosterone and estrogen, and our examples of neurotransmitters are serotonin and dopamine. And over the course of the year, when you study the other topics, that will become clearer and clearer. But it is important to know that from the get-go. The other thing that students often confuse is the difference between a genotype and a phenotype. Now, a genotype is the genetic code and a phenotype is a physical characteristic. So for example, you could have the genotype or the genetic code to be particularly tall, but unless you have uh, the appropriate environment around you, that physical characteristic of being tall will not be able to be manifested. It won't actually happen. Uh, so the outcome, so a phenotype, is a combination of the two. It's to do with your genetic code, your genotype, and the influence of the environment. Uh, the final thing that I want to discuss is the structure of the nervous system. Now this is another area that students often get confused on because there are so many key terms. But if you think about it, it's not that hard at all. You have the nervous system, it's further subdivided into the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is divided into the brain and spinal cord, um, and the spinal cord uh, relays information from the brain to the body. And the peripheral nervous system, which is subdivided into the somatic and autonomic nervous systems. Uh, the somatic is um, to do with sensory and motor neurons, and the autonomic nervous system is to do with involuntary action. Key thing to note there is that it's called the autonomic nervous system and not the automatic nervous system, which is another common error that students make. The autonomic nervous system then is further subdivided again into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic is uh, to do with a fight or flight response, uh, it's to do with increasing your heart rate and elevating your blood pressure and the parasympathetic is to do with the body's rest and digest response and that is to do with reducing your blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, looking at the nervous system as a, uh, as a diagram is often an easy way to try and remember it and that is something that you do have to do, commit that to memory. Uh, so I would suggest some visual way of learning that. Fantastic. So in reference to the models of memory, the two models of memory that you've got to know are the multi-store model of memory and the working memory model. And the first thing that I would say is to try to commit these two memories so that you don't mix the two up, which again is a very common error. Remember the multi-store model is sensory register, short-term memory, long-term memory, and, and the working memory model is the central executive phonological spatio sketch cut. So the key thing to start with is don't mix those two models up. Remember, of course, within the multi-store model of memory, there was a change, and it would be helpful to know that just to kind of bump your marks up for your AO1, and that was a change from maintenance rehearsal to elaborative rehearsal. Also, within the working memory model of well, don't, don't forget the updated version of the working memory model improves the episodic buffer. Um, for the multi-store model as well, what you have to be careful of is that you know in terms of the sensory register short-term memory and long-term memory and features in terms of encoding, features in terms of capacity and features in terms of duration. For the working memory model, what you have to know is features in terms of capacity and encoding, so duration isn't specified there. Um, what I would do, or what I would suggest that you do in order to kind of help you remember those things is draw out a table. So for example, with the multi-store model, draw out um, short-term memory and leave a box for encoding, duration and capacity and fill in research there that illustrates that. So for example, you could use Jacob to illustrate the capacity of short-term memory or Miller to illustrate the capacity of short-term memory. For the duration, you could use Peter 
Billy Gibson uh, for the sensory register you could use Sperling for the capacity and duration so if you set those out neatly on the table hopefully it should help you remember them now in respect to encoding capacity and duration in the multi-store model that kind of leads you on to a question that might specify what is the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory for example now a question asking you about difference is asking you about a difference in relation to encoding, capacity and duration. So again, it's crucial that you understand what they are in terms of what they mean and research that supports those differences. And I think that's it. So that's it in terms of the working memory model in the multi-store model. I'm not going to go over the details of the model because hopefully something, that's something that you've done in lessons. What I would suggest though is that you draw them out as diagrams as well as write them in kind of prose form, which should help you with remembering them. Um, what we're hoping to have, uh, I think, in our next vlog is Cora Flanagan is going to do a bit of a guest spot for us and just, I think, talk through some of the memory science with you, so that'll be good.